The Chosen Season 2 Episode 5 has officially been released, and man, oh man, do we have some stuff to talk about. So, let's talk about it. Hey everybody, my name is David Tate and this is now Let's Be Honest About Movies and today we are going to be talking about the fifth episode of The Chosen Season 2 which I believe is titled Spirit. Uh, as of the time of me recording this, the show, the episode just aired a few hours ago and the live stream finally just ended so I came in here as soon as it ended and I'm going to record this video so at the time that you're actually watching this I guess the episode probably aired last night. Uh, and it is my pleasure to tell you that I think that this episode might be one of my favorite episodes of The Chosen so far. Uh, if you haven't been on this channel, I actually have videos for every episode of The Chosen, uh, and so you can get my insights and my reflections on all of those, uh, and you'll know that this is saying something, because I actually really like this show, and they have yet to come out with what I would call a bad episode. Uh, but I think that this episode might very well be one of, if not my single most favorite episode. I'm gonna to have to rewatch it a few more times uh, and go through my episode breakdown, which I'll do uh, as soon as I possibly can, uh, in order to get a better opinion on it. But just my quick thoughts, I actually really, really enjoyed this episode, which is saying something, uh, because typically the things that I love the most about the show is how they adapt scripture. Uh, in this episode, as far as I can think about, there's nothing directly from scripture that takes place in this episode, except for a few verses in John chapter 5, which just pick up where uh, the last episode left off. So that's saying something, that this is one of my favorite episodes when really there's nothing directly from scripture that takes place in it other than those few verses in John chapter 5. So yeah, uh, but that being said, uh, I'm just going to talk about some quick talking points here. This video probably won't be too, too long. Um, you know, it won't be my multiple hours long like my episode breakdowns are, but if you do enjoy this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel and maybe turn on the notification bell so that you will get the notification whenever I do release more videos, including my episode breakdown where I do go in-depth through the whole episode. We'll actually just be watching the episode all the way through and I will just be talking about it, I'll be pausing the video and we'll just be breaking down the whole episode very in-depth. Those are really long episodes, uh, really long videos, so be sure to come back and watch that if you want a more in-depth breakdown. Uh, which I'll try to come out with um, sometime soon. But that being said, I have got five main talking points, I think. Let me see. I've got my notes here. <laughs> I've got five main talking points I wanted to talk about, and then we'll briefly at the very end talk about, um, you know, the little episode preview for episode six that they uh, kind of gave us at the very end of the live stream. Uh, but that being said, the first thing I wanted to talk about is that, um, basically, I'm just going to break these all down and just different stuff that happens in the episode. I'm just trying to be a little bit systematic about it so that you can know what we're talking about here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is that this episode picks up where the last one left off, and presumably episode six is also going to pick up where this one left off. So these are very back-to-back -back episodes, which is kind of cool. Uh, and we get to see a lot of the aftermath of the... Um, what happened in the last episode, and so that's the first thing I was wanting to talk about, uh, because the last episode, if you remember, uh, episode four of season two, uh, that may basically culminated with Jesus coming to this paralytic guy named Jesse and healing him, but it happened on the Sabbath day, right? And so if you know anything about the Gospels, or if you know anything about the Jewish customs, uh, this was a big no-no, uh, and so Jesus, he's, perfectly, uh, he's purposefully doing this uh, in order to rustle some feathers a little bit, and kind of maybe frustrate a little bit of people, and to cause some trouble, uh, or in his words, to stir up the water, and... Um, He's made a lot of people mad, but he's also made a lot of people really happy, including Jesse, who we do get to see in this episode. He's ecstatic to be able to walk on his feet again, uh, and it's just really nice to see how he's reacting to this. Um, the episode actually opens up with him talking with some of the religious leaders, uh, and they're asking him more about Jesus. And we don't get to see that Jesse met up with Jesus again, uh, but you can infer that that happened because what Jesse's talking about here is he's actually talking about, like, he tells them information that Jesus did not give him whenever they encountered each other at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, he tells them his name is Jesus, first off, uh, whereas he did not know Jesus' name. Uh, and then he also informs them that Jesus was going to meet up with his cousin. Uh, so these are in, this is information that Jesus did not give him at the pool of Bethesda, which lets us know that they met up 
uh, at some other point later on, which is, um, that does align with the Gospels. If you go read John chapter 5, Jesus heals the lame man, and then they depart, and then later on, Jesus comes and finds him again in the temple, he tells him his name, and all that stuff. Um, and I do have some thoughts about this. Um, I will reserve those thoughts for my episode breakdown because I want to go a little bit more in depth to Jesse's character and his reaction and stuff. Uh, but for the sake of this shorter video, I just want to say it was really nice to see uh, how ecstatic he was. And uh, it was just really fun to see his reaction to being able to walk again. Uh, but that being said, we also get to see the aftermath. Uh, on the Pharisee side and how they're increasingly frustrated by what's happening with Jesus. Uh, we get to see Shimuel and his, um, I don't know if we know that other guy's name yet, um, but you know, his, his buddy, uh, Shimuel and that guy, they're, they're kind of going around and they're trying to see if they can do something about this increasing problem they're having with Jesus. Uh, and they're kind of facing some pushback here, uh, which ultimately seems to be rooted in Nicodemus, uh, who we don't get to see in this uh, he's not in this season at all, but he's still a present force, and he's kind of fighting for Jesus on the other side very subversively, right? So he's not publicly proclaiming that he is one of Jesus' followers or anything, because technically he isn't. Uh, but he is kind of defending Jesus a little bit and giving him a fair shot, which is something that's consistent with Nicodemus in the Gospels. If you go to John chapter 7, uh, you actually have Nicodemus kind of coming in there and not saying he follows Jesus, but he is kind of defending him a little bit and giving him uh, the right to... Um, a fair, you know, being being um, analyzed fairly. Yeah, so the first thing I just wanted to address is that we do get the aftermath of that, uh, and we get to see Je what happens with Jesse, we get to see what happens with the Pharisees and stuff, and we get to see that things are beginning to roll, uh, which will kind of just um, continue to happen as Jesus becomes more popular. The second thing I wanted to address is Mary Magdalene, uh, because this is probably... Um, probably this episode and the next episode are very Mary Magdalene centric, which we haven't had many episodes like that since the first season, uh, where the first two episodes were very Mary Magdalene focused, right? The first episode of the whole show was centering around Mary and her demon possession, and it finally culminates with her being freed of her demon possession. Uh, and then the second episode is about her kind of adapting, uh, to the new cult, like, you know, to a new life, um, uh, having been redeemed and, um, her learning the Sabbath customs and stuff like that. Uh, but we haven't had much about Mary other than that. She's just kind of been like a background character who's just interacting with people. Uh, but now we get to see her coming back to the forefront. And um, obviously, there's going to be spoilers in this video. Uh, if you haven't picked up on that so far, we're seven minutes in. Um, but uh, yeah, so Mary, uh, we get a little bit more of her in this episode. And we get to see that she does still struggle with some stuff from her past. Uh, and I think that that's a really cool plot point that they're bringing in here. They're showing that all because you come to Christ doesn't necessarily mean that all your past baggage just immediately goes away. Um, that would be probably a very naive way of looking at um, our relationship with Christ, right? Uh, obviously, you're positionally changed before God uh, because you get saved through what Christ has done. But uh, that doesn't mean that you're all, all of a sudden just totally um, removed from who you were in the past, right? That stuff still does affect you and you have to kind of work your way through that and you have to place your faith in Christ and you have to learn to trust him in the midst of all that. Uh, and this is one of those places where Mary's kind of relapsing because um, at the very the first scene of the whole episode is she's gathering some fruit and she sees a Roman soldier come by and presumably this is the same soldier who sexually assaulted her um, back in her past, which we didn't see that in the show, but there was a brief little flashback in the first episode of season one. Um, that strongly hinted at that. And if you go read The Chosen, uh, oh, this side, <laughs> uh, The Chosen novelization, uh, if you go read that, it actually goes in a little more detail about that. Um, but, so it seems like that might have been the same exact guy, I'm not sure, or maybe just every time she sees a Roman, she kind of has that. But um, we haven't seen her reacting that way to other Romans, so it seems like maybe she saw the actual guy. And that caused her to react very negatively. And basically, um, to not go into too much detail, once again, saving that for the in-depth breakdown, uh, it ends with her just going, uh, she kind of relapses, goes back to her old ways a little bit. Um, it seems like she's almost kind of struggling with like the demon possession a little bit there, um, at one point, which we'll talk about later. Um, but she ends up going down to what I presume is a, um, it's a bar in Jericho, like an underground little tavern. Uh, and she uses her past, like, you know, she talks about being at the hammer, which is the, uh, the tavern up in Galilee, um, in Capernaum. And so it seems like that's where she's going there. I couldn't, there's some of the dialogue that I kind of missed out on there. And so whenever I rewatch the episode a few more times, I'll have a better idea of what was going on. I was a little bit confused watching it the first time. 
Um, and I also had some friends with me, and we were talking about it, and I think we just missed some stuff. Um, but, yeah, so she ends up kind of uh, going missing. Uh, and that is one thing that I was curious about um, in the episode, because there's one point where I think that somebody tells Rayma to go check up on Mary. And then, later on, Rayma is just seen with everybody else warming herself by the fire, and it's now nighttime, and everybody's wondering, where's Mary at? And then Rayma's like, oh wow, I didn't notice that she was gone. And then Matthew also didn't notice that uh, Mary was gone, which, once again, that's something we'll talk about in a second, uh, or specifically about Mary and Matthew. Um, but it was very odd to me that neither of these two people would have known that she was gone. Uh, given that she'd probably been gone for multiple hours, and these two people seem to have a particular eye on Mary. Rama, because Mary is literally the only other woman in the group, and so you would think that they would constantly be kind of near each other. Uh, so it's weird to me that she didn't notice that. And Matthew, well, he has his eyes on Mary for another reason, which, once again, we will we'll address in just a second. But, um... Yeah, so I found I did find it kind of odd that none of them noticed that Mary was missing until a little bit later, but this is something that's going to play until the next episode, so I see why they held that back a little bit. Uh, so that was the second thing, right? The first thing was the aftermath of episode four. We get to see the effects of that. The second thing is Mary Magdalene and her whole storyline here. That's very interesting. I'm excited to see where that goes. The third thing I wanted to talk about is the demon-possessed guy that we get to see in this episode. Uh, this was very, uh, it was a very different thing to see in this show. Uh, we didn't get to see that much of Mary's demon possession in episode one of the first season. Uh, but this guy, we get to see a lot more of what's going on here. And it's more of a very, it's a classic take on demons, probably. It's a little bit different, um, but it, it's definitely emphasizing the whole possession aspect of it, uh, kind of exorcist-like. And it was honestly a little bit terrifying at points. Uh, to where when you're watching this, you're like, whoa, this is... um. This is strange. You know, you just hear this guy shrieking in the back distance. He's like, Rah! and you're like, oh, okay, what's going on here? Uh, I remember I was really confused because the first time we encountered this guy actually isn't in the climactic scene in the around the tents. It was actually earlier on whenever Simon the Zealot was training. And um, he hears this noise, and it sounds like an animal. Uh, and I remember I was very confused because the noises, I was like, that sounds like a human making those noises, but it sounds like they're impersonating an animal. And then sure enough, Simon wanders in there and it's a demon possessed guy. And you're like, oh, okay, I see what they're going for here. But fast forward a little bit, this guy actually wanders into the camp. Uh, and we have this funny moment where Thomas, you know, Thomas and Matthew, they've been making food. Uh, and Thomas has been over there silently judging Matthew and trying to call him out on his arrogance, which Matthew seems to be unaware of, but he does seem to be willing to consider. Uh, and Thomas, uh, whenever he sees this demon-possessed guy, he grabs a knife, and Matthew, he also gets very protective. He's like, Argh! and he grabs a spoon, and that was just really funny. I enjoyed that. That was a that was a good laugh, because Matthew, he's, he's just trying to be helpful, and, you know, he just, he's not thinking. I mean, obviously, he knows that a spoon's not going to do much, but he's just, he's grabbing the first thing he sees, and he just wants to fit in with everybody, and he wants to protect the people, and so he grabs a spoon, and you're like, classic Matthew. Uh, so that was really good. But... Matthew grabbing a spoon and Matthew's concern over the whole situation does bring up another thing I wanted to address before we actually got to the demon-possessed guy. Uh, and that is Matthew's growing affection for Mary. Uh, this is something that we've seen here, something that Thomas does not seem to understand, uh, because Thomas seems to be so focused on Rayma that he's getting kind of jealous and he thinks that Matthew is focusing on Rayma. Uh, and he's like, ah, oh, why are you looking at her? And Matthew, he's even like, you know, when your emotions get involved, you're very illogical. Uh, because really, it seems like Matthew has his eyes on Mary. And I'm just going to say, Matthew and Mary, then those two names kind of roll off the tongue together, you know? And so I kind of am interested to see where they're heading there. Uh, you've kind of seen this coming a little bit in past episodes. There's been places where uh, you haven't really seen it as much on Matthew's side. You've seen it more on Mary's side, where she kind of just, she's very nice to Matthew in different places. Um, in the first episode of this season, you know, everybody's being kind of rude to Matthew whenever they're leaving uh, to go look for Jesus. Uh, and Matthew stays behind, and then Mary just kind of turns around and is very nice to him. Uh, and then I think in the second episode, whenever they're all talking about learning scripture and everything, well, you know, Ma Mary's kind of getting closer to Matthew. Like I think they kind of understand each other because neither of them know scripture that much. Uh, but then they're they're kind of you know they're they're hitting it off a little bit, uh, just very friendly. But then whenever you get to the last episode we watched, episode four, whenever they're at the um, they're celebrating the feast of Tabernacles, sitting around a dinner table. You can see that there's a few times where Matthew says something and Mary kind of sends him some eyes and you're like, hmm, something's going on here. And then now in this episode, you kind of see it might be reciprocal uh, because uh, while Thomas and Matthew are making the food, 
Matthew keeps like looking, he says, something's not right here. And he notices that Mary is having headaches and that she keeps drinking something uh, at different points and she keeps getting frustrated and bewildered. Uh, and so he's having an excessive amount of concern for her. He's kind of protective. Uh, and so I think it's kind of adorable because you're like, oh, this is, I don't know. Obviously dating and stuff wasn't really a thing back then and relationships weren't as based on romance as they are nowadays. Um, but in a show like this for a modern audience, I think that's a fine inclusion. And... All because romance wasn't the driving force of relationships doesn't mean that they had to be devoid of romance, right? I mean, typically back then, marriages were like arranged marriages, typically. Um, but uh, usually, obviously, there should be romance involved, right? I mean, usually in that case, um, the benefit that they had to that is that they had to learn to love one another and they had to learn to bring the romance. It wasn't necessarily always a natural thing from the get-go. Um, but... I have no problem with that. I mean, we're, this show is for a modern audience, so it doesn't have to be perfectly how things would have been back then. And I see no reason why this wouldn't work, you know? So uh, I think it's cool that they're kind of doing this thing with Matthew and Mary. But let's go back to the demon-possessed guy, because during all this, this is where we get to see this, you know, this fiercer side of Matthew come out, and he runs out there with the spoon, uh, and this demon-possessed guy comes in, and Matthew's actually the one who steps forward first, and he's, like, wanting to fight the guy. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Mary actually ends up kind of stepping forward and ends up kind of protecting them because she kind of seems to speak this guy's language, right? Because this guy, you know, he's demon-possessed and the demons recognize Mary and they call her Lilith. And she says, I don't answer by that name anymore. And she's kind of trying to fight him. And at one point it seems like she is getting the power over him. Uh, but it doesn't work, and so he lunges at her, and, like, just super quick, Simon the Zealot, who's been watching this entire time, right? Simon's been watching from a distance because his brother got healed, and he's become convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and so Simon, he jumps in there, uh, and he attacks the guy. Uh, and I just gotta say, I was a bit disappointed in Simon right here. Uh, maybe they just didn't have a very good choreographer, like a stunt coordinator or something like that for the episode, uh, but Simon, he's been training as a trained assassin for, you know, he's been training to be an assassin with an assassination group, with an extremist group, the Zealots, for 25 plus years. Uh, I don't know the exact timetable, but we know that his brother was paralyzed or lame for 38 years and he's been at that pool for 25 years. And so we know that um, Simon left him at some point between there. So at least 25 years, Simon's been training to be this trained assassin who can fight and do all this stuff. Yet he doesn't hold himself very well in the fight. And I know people might say, okay, well, this guy's demon-possessed, so he's extra strong and stuff like that. That's fine. But from the very beginning, Simon gets in there. He's got his knife out. He's looking at the guy. And then he looks away. Uh, and then it's whenever he looks away that the guy attacks him. And I was just very... Like, as a person who used to train martial arts and stuff, I was like, dude, you trained for 25 years, and you've got a demon-possessed guy who you know is demon-possessed because you've talked to him before. You know this guy's got some issues going on, and you're just going to look away from him whenever he's that close to you? And so the guy attacks him, knocks his knife out of his hand, and he's choking Simon on the ground. And I was like, this is a pretty poor introduction. I mean, I mean, I don't know. It, 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 like, I felt kind of bad for Simon because he's probably the super macho, awesome dude who knows how to fight really well. Yet he gets defeated in his very first fight within like five seconds and he's being choked on the ground. Uh, so I felt kind of bad for him. But then of course Jesus comes running in and he's like, get out of here! And he just kind of waves his hand and the demon leaves. And that's just uh, Jesus flexing on everybody because he's like, I'm God, I can do this, demon be gone. Uh, so that was actually pretty cool. Uh, but I, I did feel kind of bad for Simon the Zealot because I was like, oh man, like... My poor guy. <laughs> uh, but speaking of that, uh, we're talking about Simon the Zealot now. That is the fourth thing I wanted to talk about. Simon the Zealot. Because we actually get him being called at this uh, point in the episode. And this would bring us to 11 disciples out of the 12. Uh, we don't have Judas Iscariot yet. I don't think he's going to be introduced in this season. Um, but uh, that we're, we're just one short now, right? We've got 11 out of the 12, and that's very exciting. Uh, we were introduced to Simon in the last episode, and now officially he has become part of the number. Um, and I really liked his interaction with Jesus here, because, you know, he gets up after Jesus casts out the demon from the guy, and uh, they get to meet the guy. The guy's name is Caleb and stuff. And as they go off, um, Simon, he, he says to Jesus, You killed my brother. And Jesus says, Yes. And then Simon says, that means that you're... And then Jesus doesn't even let him finish. He says, yes. Uh, and I thought that was really cool because the implication is that means you're the Messiah because if you go back to episode four, um, Simon had said this thing to his brother in a letter and he said, whenever you walk on two feet, I will know the Messiah has come. Uh, 
Uh, and so now his brother's walking on two feet. And sure enough, he did stand true to that, right? He wasn't just speaking. Sometimes we make these empty promises. Uh, but no, Simon actually believed it. He says, okay, my brother's walking on two feet. Therefore, the Messiah has come. And so I thought that was really, really neat. Uh, and so he tracked down the Messiah. I still don't know where Simon was running to at the end of episode four, because whenever he's talking with his brother, he gets really excited, then he runs off. But I, I don't know where he went to, because this picks up a little bit after that. Um, and I, I don't know where Simon went to at that point. Um, but that, that being said, he eventually gets here uh, and he gets called by Jesus. And then him and Jesus go for a walk. Uh, and they have this whole thing where Jesus tells him that he's going to be very useful to him and stuff like that. Uh, and he says, I need you to be willing to follow with my agenda, like my thing, the way that I'm going to go about this whole stuff. And, you know, Simon's thinking, okay, well, yeah, I'm going to be like a leader here. Like, we're going to cause like, you know, lead an army and stuff. Um, which actually they, they had a little joke about that earlier because right after Jesus said that he was the Messiah, um, Simon says, oh, then that means these are the people, uh, implica like implying that this is the army. Uh, and it kind of just pans to all the people. And they're just like not fighters. And Jesus says, don't worry, I've got another type of army. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, but during this whole conversation uh, with Simon, uh, Jesus says, hand me your knife. Uh, and as soon as he said this, I knew what was going to happen. They're standing right next to a lake. Uh, and I was like, okay. Uh, I was saying it to my friends. And um, I was like, yeah, he's going to throw the knife into the lake. And sure enough, that's what he does. But to be fair, I was thinking he was going to give it a big old chuck. Like I was expecting him to like be like, and like throw it like really deep in the lake. I thought it would have been pretty funny. Um, either way, it was still pretty funny. Um, but as soon as he threw it fairly shallow, I knew that something had to happen with it because... I mean, if he just threw it that shallow, somebody had to come grab it, right? Nobody was just going to, like, leave it there. Um, whereas if he had thrown it a lot deeper, obviously, that would have been like, okay, nobody's going to get it. Um, but he throws it fairly shallow into the water. Uh, and that's kind of what that is. And um, this is where Simon, you know, he says, okay, well, if you don't need me for my knife and my, for my fighting, then what do you need me for? And I like what Jesus says here. He says, I don't need you for anything. I have everything that I need. I wanted you. And I thought that was really cool coming from Jesus, who is man, but who is also God, right? And that is really the message of the gospel uh, in a nutshell, right? God doesn't need us, but he wants us for some reason. Do I understand it? Not really. I have literally nothing to offer God. Like, he has everything he needs in and of himself. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they were perfectly complete and in need of absolutely nothing before the foundations of the earth. Yet then out of love, they decided to create us. And out of love, they decided to extend their grace to us even after we sinned. And out of love, they decided to call us towards salvation, even though we rejected them and rejected them and rejected them. Like, it's so weird how God is so gracious to us, despite the fact that we're so mean to him. Uh, but he doesn't need anything, right? Even the glory that we give him, it's not glory that he doesn't already possess, it's just us, like, it's basically like we're taking a spotlight and directing it his direction. Uh, he already has everything he needs. Uh, and so I like that they included that. He says, hey, I don't need you. I just want you. Uh, and that is really the paradox of the gospel to me. Uh, like, why does God want us? I don't know. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? You know, uh, who is, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? It's, it's amazing. Uh, and so I really like that they included that line. And so Simon and Jesus, they walk off. Uh, but then Atticus, the guy who we saw in episode four, we're introduced to, he's following behind. He's been keeping track of all this stuff. And he walks over to the water and he picks up the knife uh, and he holds on to it. And he just keeps a watch on this whole thing. Um, this guy, obviously, he must not have much to do because he is spending a lot of time following Simon around. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm interested to see what they do with Atticus here. Um, for a while, I was thinking, ooh, I wonder if like, this is me just trying to read stuff into it. I was thinking, ooh, maybe this is going to be Judas Iscariot or something. Um, because there was one line in here where they, it seemed like he implied that maybe he had like a Jewish name or something, but uh, I might have just misread that. Um, but I, it's very weird to me because they're focusing so much time on him. Uh, and it's not a big deal. If he's just a fictional character, that's totally fine as well. I think I just can't help my mind from speculating, especially whenever I see how much time they're focusing on him. Uh, because it already seemed like they're focusing a lot of time on him in episode four. Uh, but then... I didn't expect him to continue on to this episode, but then he was here. I was like, oh, wow. And they spent some time on him here, too. I was like, okay. So I'm interested to see what they do with Atticus. Uh, and that brings us to the fifth thing that I wanted to talk about, and the final, really, really the final thing I want to talk about this whole episode. And this was probably the aspect that made it 
one of my favorite episodes, uh, and that's why I reserved it for last. And that is the inclusion of John the Baptist uh, in this episode, because I like me some John the Baptist. He's probably one of my favorite characters in scripture, one of my favorite historical figures, that is. Uh, and that's because he is the walking personification of humility, <laughs> but also a very sarcastic and very rash and very brutal guy. Uh, and we don't really know that much about him other than just little snippets. Like every single one of the Gospels starts off not with Jesus, but with John the Baptist. And it's interesting. Um, and I just, I've loved the character all my life, um, even more so in the last few years. And so I like seeing him included. And I think the guy who plays him in the show does a very good job. I think his beard looks kind of funny. Um, <laughs> but I think it's supposed to a little bit. Um, but I love that they included that here. And we actually get interaction between John the Baptist and Jesus, which we don't really have much of that in the Gospels other than um, whenever Jesus is baptized. And then a little bit later on, once John's in prison, he sends some messengers to Jesus and they kind of interact via an intermediary. But uh, I thought this was a very good scene. Uh, and there were a few things I wanted to talk about about this particular scene or really just about John's whole story here uh, in this episode. Uh, and there were three main things I wanted to talk about in regards to John the Baptist. And first off, it was his uh, the nature of him and Jesus' relationship, right? They're cousins, uh, but I love how they kind of debate with one another, spe uh, specifically in the scene uh, whenever they're by the lake, right? Obviously, you see that there's this love between them where they're very familiar with one another. They really love each other uh, as family, but also just as friends as well. Um, and John always has his reverence for Jesus, but they have this very open dialogue with one another and they get into a little bit of a debate here uh, and we get to see that they're very different characters, very different people. Uh, and we get the same perspective from the Gospels whenever you read them. You see that John was much more of a political activist, whereas Jesus was more of a religious reformer, I guess you could say. Uh, so John, he was doing a lot of the stuff where he was calling out people for their sins, specifically uh, because his whole thing was calling people to repentance. And so he was calling out the Jewish people saying, hey, this is your issue. This is your issue. You brood of vipers, you this, you that. Y'all need to repent. Y'all need to come to God, get ready for the Messiah. Uh, and so he was really trying to correct the Jewish people and get them ready for the Messiah, which is his role. And so because the Jewish religious system was so specifically tied to the political system, there was a lot of political activism going on here. Uh, and ultimately that will lead to his arrest, which I'm assuming is coming in the next episode. Um, but Jesus, on the other hand, he really never delved into politics at all. Uh, I mean, he did interact with the religious authorities who were kind of political figures, but he wasn't really focused as much on social issues as he was with religious reformation uh, and calling people out on the spiritual matters of the heart and helping them recognize that their need for repentance goes down to their very heart, not just their actions. Uh, and John the Baptist, he was probably, uh, he, he was more, you know, the classic prophet figure. Um, very much like Elijah, which is addressed here. Uh, and there were key differences that you could see in this episode alone. Uh, and the difference, uh, first off, in their character, uh, where John himself says that he's a much more impulsive person, whereas Jesus kind of plans stuff out, and he's very methodical with everything, uh, which, once again, very consistent with Scripture. I mean, I don't know necessarily if John was that impulsive in Scripture. Um, he might have had stuff planned out as well. Uh, but Jesus is definitely methodical in Scripture. Like, he knows what things are going, like, what all is going on to a T. Uh, especially if you read the Gospel of John, you see this because every conversation Jesus has is at the exact right time and it goes through the exact right series of stuff. And even if people are trying to divert the conversation, Jesus knows what they're going to say and he's planned ahead and he still gets to where he wants to go to uh, in the conversation. And so Jesus is definitely very methodical, whereas John in this is very impulsive. And so he gets kind of frustrated with Jesus because their difference in character actually highlights another difference they have. And there's this difference that they have in timing, right? Where John, even in this episode, he says at one point, I just want you to get to the point, right? I want you to get to the point where you can accomplish what I'm expecting you to accomplish. Uh, and in this way, he's actually very similar to the Jews at that time period who were expecting this messianic figure to show up and wage war on the Romans and destroy them and uh, bring in the kingdom of God. Uh, and so he's saying, dude, get to that point. Like, I'm setting stuff up for you, but you haven't done what I'm wanting you to do. Uh, and this is, once again, very reflective of what Jesus is going to be corresponding with John about once John is in prison. Uh, and maybe we'll get that in the show because, you know, in the Gospels, we actually have John sending some of his disciples to Jesus and be like, hey, like, are you the one or should we expect another? Because you're not doing what I expected you to do. Um... And another point in this episode, he says to Jesus, uh, it's in the same scene, right? He says, I'm just impatient for you to get to work. Uh, and I just thought that was interesting because I think 
Um, first off, it says something about John the Baptist, which I think is, is consistent with how people place this expectation on the Messiah. Um, and that's why, by and large, the Jews re rejected Jesus, because he, he was not the expected Messiah. Um, and they were impatient with him, right? Uh, they, they thought, okay, if you are the Messiah, you better overthrow the Romans. But if you're not doing that and you're you're kind of claiming stuff we're not comfortable with, well, we're going to crucify you. Uh, and I think that should be a warning to us uh, not to place expectations on God that he hasn't already placed on himself. Uh, and so we just need to be cautious of that. We need to be aware of it. Uh, but I, I like that they include that. I think it's a good line. I'm impatient for you to get to work. Um, because I think a lot of us probably are in that place sometimes. And we want God to be doing something and we're impatient for it. But really, we need to learn to wait on the Lord. I mean, just go like study the scriptures and see how often it says, wait upon the Lord. Uh, but this brings up another difference between Jesus and John the Baptist, right? They have different characters, they have different timing, uh, and ultimately this is because they have different amounts of knowledge. Uh, and this is probably the more heartbreaking thing here because there's certain things that John says throughout this conversation that shows that he is totally oblivious to what is to come. Whereas there are things that Jesus says in the conversation that shows that he is abundantly aware of what is to come. John's asking him to speed up the process, and Jesus knows that if he speeds up the process, it will lead to his death, and it will lead to his crucifixion, and his, you know, all that stuff. And he says, okay, there's a certain timing to all this stuff. Uh, and so Jesus knows what's to come. But then, Jesus also knows about John's death, and what's going to happen there, because John, he says, hey, you'll never believe it. You haven't heard the news? Herod, he has married his brother Philip's wife, and I'm going to go call him out on it. And then Jesus says, you know what's going to happen as a result of that, right? And John says, I've been arrested plenty of times. It'll be fine. I'll go in there. I'll get out. It'll be cool. And Jesus says, okay. And Jesus doesn't seem to... I mean, Jesus ultimately, in the end, uh, later on in the episode, he says, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. And so he affirms that John is doing the right thing, but you can tell the human side of him wants to tell him not to. Uh, because he knows that that will lead to John's death. Because if you know the Gospels... Uh, this time, John will get arrested, and he won't get out because um, Herod's wife, uh, which was his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, um, she will ultimately end up demanding the head of John the Baptist through her daughter or niece or yeah, yeah, her daughter Herod's niece, and um, yeah, so John will be killed uh, as a result of this. He'll get in prison. He'll be killed. Uh, and so it's a very sad moment because Jesus knows something that John doesn't, but he also doesn't directly tell him. And so there's a lot of weight to this. And I just thought that was very interesting. But then, uh, it, it, th so they have this debate, right? They have this very um, back and forth relationship where they have a lot of differences. But ultimately, I'm, I'm glad they included this line because we get to see one thing about John that is my favorite aspect of his character in the, in the Bible. Uh, and he says to Jesus, my heart is yours. My life is yours. Uh, and here we see the humility of John because he says, Jesus, you know, we've got all these differences. There's things I don't understand about you, but I was sent here to pave the way for you. And so I trust you no matter what, even if I don't understand. Uh, and if that won't preach, I don't know what will. Um, in John chapter three, uh, we have this moment where his John's disciples come to him and they're getting kind of frustrated because Jesus is getting more popular than uh, they were. Um, and Jesus, actually, some of the disciples who followed John are now following Jesus, uh, including some of the 12, right? Andrew, uh, Simon, uh, possibly John. Like, some of them were following John the Baptist. Now they're following Jesus. And some of John's disciples are frustrated, uh, and they say to him, hey, like, this is an issue here, right? Uh, and ultimately, John says a lot more than this, but he culminates his saying by finally saying, he must increase, I must decrease. Uh, and that's the life of John the Baptist summarized. It's all about exalting Jesus and lowering himself. Uh, even if he doesn't understand what's going on, he's always going to point people towards Jesus. And I think that's an amazing thing. And I'm glad they included that line, um, like the, the fact that my heart is yours, my life is yours uh, in this episode, because I think that should be our response to Jesus as well, right? Even if you don't understand what he's asking you to do, even if you don't understand his plans, my heart is yours, my life is yours. He must increase, I must decrease. Uh, and so that was my absolute favorite part of this episode. And then ultimately, you know, it culminated with their final farewell. Uh, and Jesus hugs him and he says, I love you. And they, you know, Simon's standing there as John walks off. Uh, and the look, like Jonathan Rumi, the guy who plays Jesus, the look on his face is just heartbreaking because he knows that this is going to be the final time he sees John the Baptist alive. Right? And that's sad uh, because John doesn't know that. John's just walking off. He's like, see you later, man. Uh, but Jesus knows. He says, you know, he's like, the look, he's like, man. This is sad. And you know, it, it does seem like John the Baptist's death really does affect Jesus in the Gospels as well. Um, 
ultimately, I mean, I don't think, I don't know, maybe his death will be reserved for season three, um, but ultimately that leads to the feeding of the 5,000, um, in the Gospels at least, because it says that when he heard about uh, John the Baptist's death, he decided to retreat and he goes across the lake and he, um, you know, he, he's trying to be alone, but then people follow and they, they meet him there and he doesn't get to be alone. So we'll see what they do there, but... Yeah, so really good episode. I really liked everything here. Those were my five main talking points that I wanted to address because they were absolutely amazing. And I can't wait to watch this episode again to see what else we can get out of it. Um, but that being said, I did want to briefly address what we might be getting going forward because we did get a little preview at the end of the live stream. Uh, and it seems like the main three things that we're going to be talking about um, in the next episode is first off, we're going to have Peter and Matthew working together. Or Sorry, Simon and Matthew. We don't have his name's not Peter yet. Uh, Simon and Matthew are going to be working together looking for Mary which was something that happened at the end of this episode where Jesus was sending them off. And I think it'll be very cool to see Simon and Matthew doing that because I'm hoping that a lot of their stuff will get worked out together. And I'm hoping that Simon will get to see a new side of Matthew and maybe learn to appreciate him more. Uh, and so I like that Jesus is doing this and the situation with Mary is kind of causing that to happen. Another thing we're going to see is John the Baptist being arrested. Uh, we get that hinted at in the uh, thing. Well, it's not even hinted at. It, just, it literally says that he has been brought into custody. Uh, and so that's going to happen, uh, just as Jesus kind of foretold and as John knew. Uh, and then I think that a third thing, this is more of a prediction, I think that we might see Jesus and his disciples eating from the grain fields on a Sabbath day and people getting uh, onto them. Because we do see them walking through some high grass uh, at one point in the preview and Jesus is saying, you know, it seems like the longer we're here, the less people understand us. And so I'm assuming that that is probably what's going to happen there. And that is a biblical event. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm looking forward to it and I'm really excited. But that being said, I've talked long enough. And so I guess it's probably about time to wrap up this video. Uh, if you liked this video, please, like I said, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, but also comment below and let me know what you thought about this episode. Tell me what your favorite scene was. Tell me whatever you want. Uh, just let me know what you thought about this episode, what you like about The Chosen. I love interacting with y'all and just hearing what y'all have to say. That being said, a few announcements real quick. Uh, I'm going to get this video uploaded as quickly as possible. And obviously, if you're watching this, it's already been uploaded. But currently, even as I am talking right now, my episode four in-depth breakdown is currently uploading. Uh, I meant to, I was intending to have that uploaded before this episode even aired. But uh, well, the file came out corrupted, so I filmed a two and a half hour video. The file came out corrupted. And so whenever you watch that video, you'll see some of the editing's a little bit off. And that's because I tried my best to repair the file before filming a little bit more of it. Um, but that episode uh, breakdown should be to you as soon as possible. Hopefully, by the time you're watching this, it's already uploaded. We'll see. Um, but it's a really long file, so it's taking a while to upload. Uh, but that being said, that's all I got to say here. Um, I will try to get my episode 5 breakdown to you as soon as possible. I'm, I want to watch it a few more times to digest it and take some notes and get some stuff there. But uh, as soon as I can, I will get that breakdown to you. Um, but until then, I guess that's all I got to say. So thank you so much for watching. Now let's be honest about movies. I always love getting to interact with you all. So please, once again, just comment below. That also gets this video out there so more people can see it, more people can watch this, and more people can watch The Chosen. So please, whatever you can do to support me, that'd be great. I would thank you so much. Um, but yeah, so thank you for watching this video. I love you guys. I love this show. I am so excited to watch this episode again and again and again so I can learn to see where it actually ranks amongst the other episodes in my mind and in my heart. <laughs> that being said, I will talk to you all later. Be sure to keep a smile on your face and don't let anybody steal your joy. Love you guys. See you all later. Bye.